Um, today's verses are in Luke chapter 19, and we are um, we're going to the end of that chapter, and then next week they're gonna we're gonna do Easter, and then the week after that we're gonna come back to the beginning of chapter 19 because they just want to do Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday on the times that it's Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, and um, so today's lesson talks about the word it the title in it was talking about worship, and so. It comes from two words, meaning worthiness and quality or condition. So it it means kind of the condition of how worthy you are to be to be worshipped, basically. It goes together. So the um, the study school guide said to worship is to declare someone or something worthy to receive our adoration and allegiance. Um. And the Bible teaches us that human beings are made to worship God. He created us to worship him. You know, he also created a shape in our heart that just fits Jesus. There's nothing else we can try to put in that spot that would fit. It's just like a puzzle piece. We can try all those pieces and you can turn them every direction that you can, but they won't ever fit there unless it's Jesus. And so that's the significance of the priority that God has for our lives. It says the worship also implies obedience and giving God the priority in our lives. Now, at the, mo- at the point where most of us are in our lives, we have the time to get up in the morning and read our Bible, and drink coffee, or at night read and, and read your Bible before you go to bed or at some point in time during the day. But I remember a point in time when I had two little boys running around my house, and when I got ready to go to bed at night, I was ready to go to bed. And when I woke up in the morning, it was hit the ground running, and I see it when we go to visit our kids. And sometimes it breaks my heart because I know they don't have time to refuel themselves with the Word of God that they really need for their marriage to survive, raising three children, and then them to be able to survive not having all those children and relearning each other because we've all been through that. And, And that's a tough time. So it's important that we can keep God as a priority in our lives for for the times that we are. And every day those that priority changes for where we are and who we're with about where we place God in that. Um, so today's lesson is a day about a day in the life of Jesus when he received some praise and worship. We're gonna see something that's interesting about this. Um, do you remember? Do you recall going to a parade? Think about when you went to a parade. Did you ever go to the rodeo parade in Houston? Yes. As a kid? What did we go to the March Day? Oh. Huh? Yeah. It, to where? March. You marched in it, yeah. Um, you wore the hat. Fine. Fine parade. Yeah, I remember going. I remember marching in the San Jacinto Day parade. Remember that? Because uh, I was on the drill team at South Houston High School, and we marched in the San Jacinto Day Parade every year. And um, so there was some event that was connected to that that you were celebrating. In this case, it was Passover that they were coming in to celebrate. Um, I think also about the parade that celebrated the Astros. Do you remember how many people they said showed up to that? Like 500,000 people. They were hanging out of the, the buildings, and they were in the in the parking garages. And, you know, they came to worship somebody. They came to celebrate somebody, and they came to celebrate the heroes. They were riding on fire trucks, and they were very visible when they won the World Series. When they won the World Series. Yeah. yeah. Probably wouldn't get that now. <laughs> Probably wouldn't get that now. Um, but, there, but, but amongst all the people in the crowd, you saw signs, you saw smiles, you saw cheering. You saw all these events of happiness and joy time and friendship together, being together. So we kind of are going to see that a little bit today, but it's really a different perspective. In uh, in Luke 19, in the verses we're going to have, Jesus gave some specific instructions concerning this parade that was going to be in Jerusalem. Now, we also have to remember, in the first part of Luke chapter 19, which, of course, we haven't got there yet, <laughs> They, they talk about Jesus was in Jericho, and he met a man in Jericho that wanted to see him, and this little man tried, climbed up in a tree. Who was that? 
Zacchaeus. He was in Jericho when he saw Zacchaeus. And Jericho was one of the lowest cities on earth. They said it was 800 feet below sea level. But then Jerusalem was like 3,000 feet above sea level. So basically coming from Jericho to Jerusalem, they said was literally about straight up, and it was 17 miles between the two of them. So they come from Jericho, and they're coming in. And all this time as they're coming in, Jesus has been talking to his disciples about what was going to happen in Jerusalem. And he, he told them. In, um, in Luke 18, in two verses, he told them what was going to happen to him. That they were coming and going in Jerusalem, and he was going to be tried, and he was going to die. So can you imagine what they're thinking as they're heading up this, trogging up this road to get into Jerusalem with what Jesus had been telling them, if they even remembered it, because it does say that they didn't understand all the things that he was telling them. But here they are climbing this road into Jerusalem. So as they get into Jerusalem, um, who can read for me verses 29, 28 through, through 34? 38, 19, 28 through 34. It's listed there on your in, in, uh, Amplified Version. You can read along, but somebody that's got it wants to read it. Okay. Then he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass when he went through there to Bethany, to Bethany. At the mountain called all that, that he had sent to his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, for as you enter, you will find a coat tied on which one has no set. Loose it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, Because the Lord has said it. So those who were saying, That's good. That's good. That's good. Okay, so where are they? They're approaching where? They're coming into Jerusalem and they're approaching where? Bethphage and Bethany. Now, Bethany had an important, there was a real important thing that happened at Bethany. Lazarus was raised from the dead in Bethany. That's where Bethany, that's where they lived. It was in Bethany. And that was Jesus' home base mostly when he came to Jerusalem because Mary and Martha and Lazarus were some of his best friends and they stayed with them. And so he's in, he's in Bethany and they're heading on in. And he tells, he tells his two disciples, we don't know who they were. He may be in another, this is in all the Gospels, this story is. But he told two of them to go into the village. That village was probably Bethpage. The commentary said it was probably Bethpage. And he gave them a job to do. What were they supposed to do? What kind of cult? A horse? No, it was a donkey, and there's really significance in that. During peaceful times, people rode donkeys. During war times, they rode horses. So what symbol does that tell us? Jesus comes in peace. He comes in peace. He's on a donkey. Now, what else did it say about the donkey? No one had ever ridden that donkey. So what is that? what do you think that entails? You think that donkey knew what was going on? Probably not. Um, those of you that know Randy Wallace, several years ago, Randy was the head of mounted patrol in Houston. And they had a donkey, a mule, that was part of their mounted patrol. And Randy was out in Herman Park, and he was riding the mule. And something spooked the mule, and the mule took off running with him on it and ran under a tree, and it knocked Randy off the tree, and he broke his wrist badly. So this was a this was a mule, a, a, a donkey of sorts, that was trained to have somebody on it, and it spooked and ran. So if you imagine the sounds and the, of, of all these people coming into Passover, how that donkey, if it had never been ridden, would have reacted. But in this case, it didn't react anything different. It was peaceful. So not only was the spirit of Jesus the peace that Jesus provided, he provided it to everything around him. Um, then they said untie it and um, and to bring it to bring it to him. And and the interesting thing about this is in Zechariah chapter nine verse nine, and I put it there in your notes. It's at the very bottom. <clears throat> it was prophesied that the Messiah would enter Jerusalem. 
575 years before it actually happened. Matthew, whose gospel was written primarily for the Jews, included this verse was from, from Zechariah. It says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, it was written in Zechariah, and the Jews understood what their word of God was, that they, they, they heard this prophecy. Every child probably could tell they could tell you the story of what the Messiah was going to come riding in on. And he did. This prophecy came right before their eyes. It came unfolded right in front of their eyes. Um, then it said they were to untie that donkey. And when they were asked what they were doing, they were to say that the Lord needs it. So probably these people that these people where the donkey was, probably Jesus knew them or had at some time known them. That it wouldn't have been likely that, you know, total strangers. I mean, one of the commentaries as I was reading, the man that wrote it said, just think about going into a going into a Lamborghini dealership and say and, and taking the car and saying, uh, Mr. Jeff needs this. You know, it, 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 you're taking somebody's mode of transportation away from them because somebody else wants it or somebody else needs it. So. Now he's headed in. He's got his mode of transportation. He's riding this donkey. Um, interestingly enough, in one of the commentaries, it said that mostly when you see pictures of the Palm Sunday riding in, you see Jesus riding side saddle, that that probably wouldn't have happened. Jesus would have been riding the donkey, straddling the donkey like he would ride a horse. He wouldn't have been riding side saddle. I thought that was an interesting note. Um they brought it, <clears throat> so who can read 35 through 38? You can read it off the page or read it in your Bible because we have different versions. Bruce? Yep. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When read came, louder. Because you don't have okay. to When you came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of, of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Okay, that's good. Okay. So um, they were they were coming into where the Mount of Olives is, and they were fixing to head on down into Jerusalem. Those of you that have been to the Holy Lands can understand visually what this was. I've never been to the Holy Lands, but <clears throat> they're coming in uh, to the Mount of Olives, and they're coming in on the east side. And so as they come in, um, well, here's here's Bethany and Beth Page, and here's the Mount of Olives. So they're coming in, and there's a, a descent that comes down. It says that the Mount of Olives sits about 200 feet above Jerusalem, and you look down into Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And those of you that have been there can, can visualize what that looks like, to stand there and look over the city of Jerusalem. Because we're going to come up against that in just a minute. So they're, they're coming in, and they head down in, and there's a multitude of people there. And as he's entering, he's coming as who? He's coming as the king, isn't he? Mm -hmm. And so what are they doing? They're starting to put what down? Palm branches. Palm branches. Okay. In, in Matthew, it says the people have palm branches. The disciples did, did what to his donkey? They put their cloaks over the donkey, so he had something to sit on. And and so that's the symbol. In um, in 2 Samuel, um, and this is in your notes, God, prom God he is promised, he's, he is the promised son of David who would rule over the kingdom of God forever. And it said, you know, he comes in peace. He's not going to be fighting against the people, against the Pharisees and the people that are, against him. That's not something he's going to come in to do. Because we know he certainly had the power to just wave his hand and they'd all be locked out. But he came in peace because he knew that this was all part of God's plan. And he and he was submissive to God's plan. In 2 Samuel in verses 7, this was God's covenant with David. He said in chapter 7, he said, I will raise up one of your descendants and make his kingdom strong. 
Your dynasty and your kingdom will continue for all time before me. So this is what he, 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 this was God's covenant with David. That this is, so is this what's happening? Yeah, here's the son. Here's the son. It wasn't Solomon because Solomon wasn't perfect. We saw Solomon was a very smart man, but what happened? He loved too many women. Who else are we hearing about that in the news right now? Yeah. So, um, so we know that the promise of this Messiah is being fulfilled right here in front of their faces. It's just coming. It's there. It says the disciples took off their armor, gar- outer garments and they made a kind of a makeshift saddle for Jesus. And this was always done for royalty. In 2 Kings 9.13, there's another king that's being, de- being honored. It says they quickly spread their cloaks on the bare steps and they blew a trumpet shouting, Jehu is king. Jehu was anointed by God to be king over Israel, and his assignment was to destroy the family of Ahab. You remember, was Ahab good king or bad king? He was a very bad king. Yeah, so Jehu was ordained by God, and this talks about how he came in. So if it's a king coming in, we see all these royalty things being laid out for Jesus as the king. Um, You know, and... Jehu was an earthly king, and Jesus was going to be a king with a much greater assignment than just to destroy Ahab. He had an assignment to prepare people for eternity. He had a greater assignment for a greater kingdom that was going to be. Well, so let's think about the crowd. What did it say was happening? What did the crowd start doing? Singing and shouting. Yeah, and I'm sure there was dancing going on. They were happy to see their king coming in. Um, it said that the it started to swell when they saw that they could see the glimpse. Think about when you were in a parade, and there was, I can remember as a young child, you didn't have any idea which person was supposed to be the person that we were celebrating, if they were riding in a convertible car, and your parents would point them out to them. Well, the Astros were all sitting on fire trucks. So if you can imagine a man on a donkey, and it's probably not a big donkey because it says it was young and had never been ridden. So he would be hard to see. But as he starts to approach, can you imagine the sounds getting louder and louder as the people coming in? And they were getting more and more excited. Um, it, it said in the commentary, Many of the people in the crowd knew Lazarus personally. They had been there when Jesus raised him from the dead. Many others had seen the lame to dance or to walk, the blind to see, and the deaf to hear. So if people had witnessed all these things happening and hearing about all these things happening, but they had never seen Jesus, and this comes to the point where they finally get a chance to see who this man is, can you imagine the excitement that's starting to build there? It just would, ha- it, and um, you could just kind of feel. And the commentary said it would be a fever pitch and almost a frenzy among the crowd. And it says they began to sing. And interesting enough, this song that they sang, "Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven." This was from Psalm one eighteen twenty six. It's in your. I wrote it in your notes. Um, It was a song about the Lord. And you know, there is a song that we sing. It's just a little, um, it says, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And that's from that verse right there, Psalms 118, 26. Um, In Matthew, he records that the people were singing, Hosanna to the son of David, Hosanna in the highest heaven. And the word Hosanna, interestingly enough, means save now. Save now. So all the, all the pieces, even what the people were saying, all fit into the prophecy of who Jesus was and what he was doing. In the book of Matthew, it tells us the people cut palm branches and they started to lay them on the ground and they were waving them in the air. I thought about bringing some palm branches today just so we could have a few. And as I was... <laughs> they're all dead. They're all dead. As I was driving along Bay Area, there's one section... Uh, right there in front of the big IBM building and they along the path and they're just 
they were all brown. They were all dead. So I was like, well, we're not going to have any palm branches this year. Um, but they waved them, and, and, and the words they were saying is like, our Messiah is here. The people that understood the prophecy and could connect it understood that this was what their prophecy had told them was going to happen. But there was one thing that many of them were still looking for. They were still looking for an earthly king. That that king was going to save them from the Romans. And that they were going to Israel, the nation of Israel, was going to be restored to its rightful place among all the nations. Because... It had been destroyed and built back up and destroyed and built back up. And they thought that their earthly king was going to come and that wasn't going to happen anymore. So there's still some misconception among those people, but they were excited because this was what they had read about and been taught about all their lives, that this man was coming. So they offered their praises. And it's interesting, one of the comments said in the verse in in Luke chapter 2, The angels said something. Glory to the God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to the people he favors. So we see those same words being praised and used again that were used when Jesus was born. So there's just so many things that happen. In verses 39 and 40, it talks about why is he worthy for our worship and our praise. Somebody can read 39 and 40. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, teaching the Jews to his disciples. And he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep, keep silent, the stones will immediately cry out. So, what did he want them to rebuke them for? Oh, they were saying he's the Messiah. For saying he's the Messiah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. For saying he's the Messiah. Because that, that would equate him with who? With God. With God. And the Pharisees didn't believe that. They believed that he was a good teacher. Um, Now, so not everybody in this parade was happy to see what was going on. But Luke is the only gospel that includes this conversation between Jesus and the Pharisees. We see the story of his entry in Matthew and Mark and John, but we don't hear anything about Jesus' rebuke, uh, Jesus' was conversation with the Pharisees here. So it's interesting. Um, And to the Pharisees and some of the people, Jesus was considered an outlaw, and there was a price on his head. We know that there was a price that was paid, 30 pieces of silver. There was a price paid. The Pharisees wanted him and Lazarus. They wanted him and Lazarus. Why would they want Lazarus? Because Jesus had raised him from the dead. Yeah, he was living testimony of what had happened. You know, if Lazarus disappeared, just totally disappeared, there's one of the testimonies that would disappear. And that would obviously have been a very outspoken one, you know, that somebody actually was raised from the dead. We kind of talked about this when we talked about saying your sins are forgiven versus seeing somebody healed. You can see somebody be healed. You can, or, I mean, if somebody fakes their blindness, and walks around like this, and then all of a sudden they say they're blind, they can see. Is there something you could doubt there? Sure. Yeah, that would be easy to doubt. But Lazarus was dead. He had been in the grave for how long? Four days. Four days. He'd been there long enough to be declared dead. And so that was truly. So the Pharisees wanted Lazarus as much as they wanted Jesus, because here's another thing that happened. But all throughout Jesus' ministry, when he healed somebody, when he healed the lepers and he told them, go away and do what? Reports to the authorities. Well, he told them to go to the authorities, but other people, when they were healed, what did he tell them? Don't say anything. Don't say anything about it. Don't say anything about it. Well, you know what? The time was not right for that. And today, on this day, on Palm Sunday, the time became right. And Jesus accepted his praise And now here is the time that Jesus says, I'm going to reveal to you truly who I am. This kind of gives me goosebumps. He accepted it, and he also encouraged it for people to go and tell what was happening. Um, Worshiping Jesus outwardly could could have brought on the wrath of the Romans, because then if there was an uprising, the Romans would come in, and there would be a problem. So that would be one of the reasons why Jesus wouldn't would tell them, don't go say who I am. 
because then we might stir up something else that causes a problem and it's not time yet. So the time comes. They're the Pharisees are criticizing Jesus for, for uh, criticizing the disciples for praising Jesus, but the Pharisees considered Jesus to be a teacher and they thought he was misinformed at that because he wasn't teaching what the Bible was telling, what, what their Pharisees were teaching. So he, they considered him to be a teacher, but to be misinformed. Sometimes they think about that. Can You know when, when like a celebrity takes on a cause about something and you kind of wonder about what they want to get out of it? I think that would be something to compare with the Pharisees' outlook towards who Jesus was. That Jesus, here's this man that we know he's a good teacher, but look at all these people he's bringing in. Now people are just surrounding him, and and um, they were jealous, and they were self-righteous. And they saw Jesus, they saw it as false worship, because here the people are worshiping somebody that's just a teacher, and he's not the king, but yet he truly was. And it just made them even madder. Well, here now Jesus says there's no need to hide the truth any longer. And he was the Messiah and he was God himself. And it was time to tell it and shout it. Now, what did it say happens? If these people keep silent, the stones will cry out. There is a song about that. If we keep our voices silent. We'll get back to that later, I'll tell you. Um, in Zechariah 2.11, um, there's a reference to the stones crying out. It says, the stones will cry out from the wall and the rafters will answer them from the woodwork. The context of this comes from Babylon. That the wickedness in Babylon was so bad that even the stones in the walls would testify as to how bad their wickedness and their evil was. That even the stones could tell the story of how bad it was there. So... We see Jesus is now heading in. We see that the Pharisees are not happy. We see the people are just out, out of control happy. But as Jesus approaches Jerusalem, he, remember he's coming in the Mount of Olives and he stops at the Mount of Olives and he looks out on the city. This is so sad. This is so sad. Who can read verses 41 through 44? And as he drew near, he oh, saw the city and wept over it, saying, You may know, even you especially in this day, the things that make for your speech, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. They will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Only Luke records this. Only Luke records Jesus stopping there and looking down on the city and how bad he hurt and his compassion for the city. Now, even those of you that have been to the Holy Land that have that view, you think about it. In Jesus' time, that city was walled, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Because Nehemiah came in and they rebuilt the walls. So that was a walled city. And he looked down on that city. If you think about the walled city, how hard and how long people had to work to build those walls around that city. And the gates that were put in. Just the magnificence of what that city would have looked like. Um, and it, the, the word Jerusalem has peace in it. It has the word peace. Salem is shalom. That's, your, that's the word of peace. Um, there in your notes I wrote the people of the city with peace as part of their name did not know what would bring them peace they didn't recognize Jesus and the Jewish leaders rejected the Messiah they refused God's offer for a salvation in Jesus Christ and even God himself came to visit them and they refused it 40 years after Jesus said these words they came true in 66 AD, the Jews revolted against Roman control. Three years later, the Roman emperor Titus was sent to crush the rebellion. 600,000 Jews were killed. This was the judgment of rejecting Jesus. 
But God didn't turn away from the Jewish people. You know what? God promises that they are his people. They are still his people. And he's still waiting for them to come back. He didn't turn away from the Jewish people that obeyed him. Because there was many Jews that followed him there. But he continues to offer salvation for both Jews and Gentiles. That's one thing that bothers the Jews, isn't it? <laughs> because they believe that they are the gifted nation. And that Jesus was that the Messiah was going to come only for them. So that's part of the reason that really bothers them. Well, as our king, Jesus deserves our worship and our and obedience. You know, the people that gave up the goat, or I mean the goat, sorry. <laughs> the people that gave up that donkey, they had obedience because they just did what they said. The king wants it. Jesus needs it. They, they were a group of people that had enough faith in who Jesus was that they gave up what they what they thought was important to them. So Jesus deserves our worship and our obedience, to be obedience to him. Our worship for him should include every phase of our lives, our time, our talents, and our treasure. What's the hardest one to give up? What's the hardest of those three to give up? For me, it's time. It's time. It's time. It's easy to take my talent and use it for something. And it's easy for me to give a money to help or support something. But to give up my time, like I said, when we, were little, when we got little people in our household, it was hard to give up that extra time to sleep a little bit later in the morning or at least to sleep until the kids started stirring. Yeah, that, our time is some of the hardest things to give up. Um, and there's that song. If we keep our voices silent, all creation will rise and shout. If we fail to praise you, Father, then will the very rocks cry out. And I remember that song. When I read that verse that says, Jesus, the rocks will cry out. If we don't praise him, then the rocks are going to cry out. And that's that's amazing in itself. But I sure would not have I wouldn't want to be in the position where I'm not praising him. So some inanimate object shows more glory to God than I do. And he created me. I hope that you have a great day today. Even if it does rain, it'll be a day to just be, be quiet and have time to just enjoy some some quietness and maybe get an extra little bit of time to read your Bible. Um. This lesson has been fun to study and uh, to read, and there's so many things in it to learn. The one thing that I did not point out in your lesson is in the book of Daniel, Daniel, um, Daniel tells a vision that he has about how many days that it's going to take from the, di from the day that, that um, a decree is issued till, till the king comes. Well, the decree that was issued was Eratoxerxes. He was a king that came after they had been, when they were in Babylon. And he issues a decree that allows them to start rebuilding. And, and, and what's going to happen and when the king is going to arrive. And that, that decree in Daniel is exactly to the day. From the day that decree was issued until it tells you how many times of sevens of sevens that are going to happen, that day is exactly the day that Jesus rode in on that donkey. It was prophesied in Daniel, and it came to be. And that's exciting to know. Because what God says is going to happen, is going to happen. And we are promised eternity. What all we've been through for this last year that's not written in our Bible, but it does say there's going to be times of suffering. And there's going to be times that come, but the promise of eternity is for sure there. Every word of God is true. Every word of God is true. That's right. Every word of God is true. Guys, thank you. Our group is down today. But, yeah. um, but we're here. We're here. Carl, will you make us in prayer? I really thought it would be a statement for this day. Thank you for your sitting back.
as you thank you again for uh, our help father and the Lord I pray for this nation and the leaders will do what they see every night. Appreciate you. And you come back to God. And step back these things and give you all the glory to what you do. Amen. Amen. Yesterday I was